my message tonight a baptism of love. God, I need that unique unction, that unique anointing that makes a sermon a message, that leaves something in the heart when they walk out the door, something that people can eat and taste for the word becomes life and dwells among us. God moved through this message. This is needed. It's vital. So speak to us now. Amen. You can speak with tongues and still be a bigot. You can boast about being full of the Holy Ghost, but still be exposed as a person full of prejudice, envy, and hatred. You can tell someone to their face that you love them and be telling the biggest lie you ever told in your life. If you're not careful, you can hate the communists so much that you learn to despise even the poor lost souls who are doomed behind the Iron Curtain. Now, friends, it's one thing to hate communism. It's another thing to hate the communists who have souls that could die and go to hell without Christ. Now, I love the communist soul, but I hate communism. There is the difference. You can break God's commandment and despise and ridicule the authorities that God has ordained. And that includes the President of the United States. You can make disparaging remarks about those in authority. And God says that that is not right, that is not love. You can go to a polling booth, you can pull the levers and vote for the candidate of your choice and carry into that polling booth a heart bursting with hatred for some politician that you don't like. In fact, you can sit in your front room and call them all kinds of names and get your blood pressure up over the boiling point. You can smile while you sit in your church pew and look like a loving little Cupid doll and put on an act like you love all your brothers and sisters, but that ain't necessarily so. You can carry a grudge against Sunday school teachers or against the deacon or the pastor. You can accuse the deacons of disloyalty, the associate pastors of laziness, secretaries for worldliness, and criticize the way the church is run and how the pastor conducts his meetings. You can say the church is dead or it's got too much life, and if you tried to please everybody, you couldn't please anybody. Or worse yet, you can be so sure of yourself that you've got all the truth and all the knowledge, and you see, you're not going to study anymore because the Holy Ghost is going to teach you. You've learned it all. And so, in your boastful way, you talk about your liberty from bondage and legalism and become so dignified and so precise that you're able to look down the end of your nose at the little holy roller group down the road who sing like hillbillies and clap their hands like thunder and dress like Salvation Army lassies. Now, there's nothing wrong with dressing like a Salvation Army lassie. Or you can be at the other extreme, vice versa. You can be a member of that big fancy church. Or rather, of that little church down by the railroad track. You can be a member of that small group. And you look at that church and the people going in it, and you can accuse them of worldliness, you can talk about their lipstick, you can talk about their earrings and their short dresses, and you can even say, isn't it terrible? Their choir even sings in robes. When I was a boy in my dad's church, that was the very height of worldliness that a choir should ever sing in robes. I've heard, I've heard sermon after sermons about the mark of the beast. Wearing robes. You can talk about love, you can sing about it, and still not have it. Because we're not to love in word or in deed or in song, or, or rather in mouth, but we're to love in deed and in truth. Now what is the truth about love? Let's look into it. I say that love is the most important evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The most important. I have said it once. If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is a baptism of love. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is a baptism of love. God actually is instructing the wild tongue in the knowledge of love. He's taking the hatred out of the heart by way of the tongue. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now, the moment 
you stand up and testify to the world that you've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you say, I've been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I've been baptized, then you must also be able to quote Isaiah 50, verse 4. The Lord hath now given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He waketh me morning by morning. He waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. Once you've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you should know what it's like to be awakened by the Holy Spirit. You should know what it's like to be instructed in the ways of knowledge and calling a person in need, spreading a word of love here and there. How easy it seems to be for some, quote, spirit-filled, end of quote, Christians who are able to lash out with tongues of bitterness and strife. Look here and look there, and like a machine gun, their tongues mow down all the opposition and everything that they don't like, or that which they deem to be ungodly or unnecessary. How easy it is for some spirit-filled Christians to have a holier-than-thou attitude. How much disgrace has been brought upon the charismatic experience through some people who have never understood this marvelous truth of the baptism of the Holy Ghost being a baptism of love. I would be awakened morning by morning. He waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. Now, which is more pleasing to the Lord? To use that gifted tongue that is now baptized only to edify a man's own soul or to dedicate that tongue to seeking out weary friends and edifying them in the spirit. And all oh, friends, if there was ever a need today for people who knew how to say the right word at the right time, it's now. You'd be surprised how just sometimes just one single word of encouragement means so much to a man. I remember a minister, a friend of mine, recently going through a terrible time. His church had persecuted him, and, and he was having personal problems in his family and in his home. And all I did was put a hand on his shoulder and say, Pastor, I'm still your friend, and no matter what happens, you'll always be a friend. He broke down and began to weep. It was the only word of encouragement he'd had, and he moved on to victory, and God brought him through on that word of encouragement. How seldom do we go to the pastor when he pours his heart out and just take him by the hand warmly and say, Pastor, that was a message from God. I'm praying for you. I'm standing with you. It's all he knows that. Well, that's just the reason you don't tell your wife you love her, sir, because you say, well, she should know it. Tell her. Go to that individual, the Sunday school teacher. I'm talking about spreading that love that God fills us with. Sadly, too many baptized tongues have been used to stir up strife. The Bible says, Proverbs 10, 12, Hatred stirreth up strife, but love covereth all sins. I was never able to understand that verse until last night. In fact, early this morning in prayer, God began to speak very clearly to me about this verse. If you look at it at face value, this verse seems to be saying that love covers all sins. In other words, love would dismiss all the wrongdoing. That's not what it means at all. Interpreted, this means love gets over all sin. It gets over things. It doesn't hold the grudge. Love is able to fly above it. Love is able to get through. Love is there when lust is conceived, and love is still there when it brings forth death. Now, I covered 3,000 miles today to get here. I covered 3,000 measured surface miles. Now, how did I cover those miles? I flew over them. I rose above them. I got here. In five hours, I covered 3,000 miles. This is really the interpretation of this verse, that love gets over sin, it mounts up like wings of an eagle, it allows no stumbling blocks to hinder it, no grudges to ground it, and no winds of adversity to stop it. Love is not stopped by what people say or do. Love keeps on going. I say that it's absolutely impossible to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and still be prejudiced. Prejudice. I think is a childish thing. The Bible said, when I was a child, I speak as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. 
When I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, I witnessed a very tragic brand of childishness when we were conducting crusades in South Africa. They call it apartheid. These good Dutch Reformed and other Protestant Christians refused to sit in my meetings anywhere near a black man. In fact, in Johannesburg, in the stadium meetings there, the blacks had to sit in a special stand uh, outside a fence. They weren't even allowed inside the fence. And it bothered me. I tried to preach. And before I preached one night, I said, Pastor, what would happen tonight if I'd opened that gate over there and let all the blacks come in and sit with us lily white people? He said, Mr. Wilkerson, 80% of your crowd would leave and 80% of the pulpit would leave too. You can imagine my surprise when we got at the airport and one of the ministers who'd invited us to South Africa as well as informed us that the black man in Africa, South Africa, didn't even have a soul. Yes. And you know, that same brand of childishness is still existing in America today. And do you know something? The most prejudiced in Alabama, southern Texas, Tennessee, are Southern Baptists, Pentecostals, and other Protestants who don't even allow a black man to sit in their church. Can you imagine the hypocrisy? Can you imagine why the hippies run out on our religion? You don't wonder why they walk out on us and say it's phony. Because we sit in our church and we sing, give me that old time religion. Makes me love everybody except the blacks. Bring them in. Bring them in. Just so they're not black. Send out the lifeline. Just watch who gets it. Yeah. You see the other hypocrisy? None of our songs make sense. None of our worship makes sense at all if we carry hypocrisy and all my friends this political program or, or what do you call this campaign that we've got now it is pregnant with all kinds of racism and talk about violence and and, and this is going to be one of the most hotly contested campaigns of all times but i want you to know that i personally believe and i believe the scripture backs me up that it's impossible for a spirit-filled christian to carry any prejudice through any election. I don't care who you're for. All I'm saying is that this is the time, my brother, sister, we need to pray for this election and keep prejudice out of our heart and ask God for his divine will for this nation. And I, I believe it's impossible for you to maintain a true relationship, a, a warm, godly relationship with your heavenly Father and still carry prejudice of any kind. Let me have a little amen out of that. For, furthermore, Christians, charismatic Christians, are supposed to love the Jews, the Japs, the Italians, the Polacks, the hippies, the masses in red China, Czechoslovakia, and even in Russia. That's right. How wonderful it was for me to sit in Helsinki. There was a man who was a car dealer, a good Christian man who had read my book in the Finnish language, and he had a sauna in his home, a Finnish sauna, and they wanted me to try a sauna bath. And I'll tell you it, how I lived through it, I don't know. They stuck me in this little thing and burned me up, and then they took me out and threw me in the snow and then put me back in that thing. And, and uh, I was pleading the blood the whole time. They kept telling me, you'll feel better, you'll feel better, you'll feel better. Well, I kept feeling worse. But after the sauna, we were having a nice finished lunch. And he began to tell us about his trips to Moscow. He sold Moscovich automobiles, the Moscovich. One beautiful pile of junk. I mean that sincerely. He, he said that himself. But he would go to Moscow, and he'd smuggle my books into Leningrad in Moscow. And he told me of people who were worshiping the Lord in Russia. He said there are literally thousands of Christians that are serving the Lord and saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And we talk about communism, friends, and often we forget that behind this communist front, 
that there are literally thousands of young people who are, and, and, and adults over there who need our prayers, our love, and our compassion. And I say, maintain your strong stand, my brother, sister, against communism, but don't forget God has called upon us to love the souls of the lost there behind the Iron Curtain. Secondly, love makes you go out of your way. Love helps you to stick your neck out for others. Paul, speaking of Priscilla and Aquila, said of them, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom I give thanks. Romans 16, 4. Now, Paul the apostle knew something of that love that was willing to give without getting anything in return. Because speaking to the Corinthians, Paul said, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Now, friends, let's start with you, dear wife. Can you say that in your home when you honestly have to look yourself in the mirror and say, my husband no longer deeply loves me. He's lost his first love. Can you say that when you feel that others around you, your innermost circle of loved ones, have lost their love for you? Can you say, I will gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved? And I can't understand that kind of human love. We've seen it at Teen Challenge for the past 10 years. I'll take a drug addict in. He's been in jail maybe 10, 15 times. And, and he's never home but once every five or six months. And sometimes he's gone two years at a time. But he's got a little wife who lives on relief. And she's faithful to him. She waits year after year hoping against hope that someday, somehow, a miracle will happen. I've seen them sit in my office and cry like little babies. She said, I've waited for him for 10 years. She'll go to jail every time he's in jail. Every day she's there. She's there to talk to him and comfort him. And she'll maintain that love. He'll abuse her. He'll cheat on her. He'll curse her. He'll beat her. And yet she'll stand there faithful, little Puerto Rican girl, little Negro girl or little white girl, just waiting for that man to straighten out. And friends... If someone human without the real love of Jesus Christ can sow so much love without getting anything in return, I've often thought how much more should Christians give out of their love in spite of the fact that people grudge you, in spite of the fact that people talk about you or misuse you or mishandle you, to love even though you're despitefully used without getting anything in return. I love you even though the more I love you, the less I be loved. That's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, answer this. When certain individuals really hurt you and say and do unloving things, what kind of reaction do you have? Do you still spend your love on them or do you take it back? The Lord himself revealed a great truth. He said that love is better when given than when received. Love is much tastier. It's much better to give it than to receive it. I've heard saying that love is give and take. Not according to the scripture. Love is a process of giving with no concern about receiving. Now, you young couples that want to know about real love, if each individual determines in his own mind to get nothing back but just to give, imagine what kind of love we would have in our homes. I have showed you all things, how that laboring you ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, listen to the words of our master, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Charismatic Christians are commanded to love even their enemies. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Now, this is hard to take, friends, but you better take it. It's his word. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Think of that one person in your life who has misused you and persecuted you and troubled you. Think of the one person you may consider an enemy. The Bible says, love them. Bless them. Love your enemies. I want to move on because isn't it really true that we would rather rejoice when we seem to be justified and our enemy falls? The Bible said, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Now what happens in your mind 
and in your heart and in your spirit as a baptized person when somebody falls and stumbles. Too often it goes like this. Well, I could have told you that. If they would have just listened, I, I knew that. I expected it. What do you expect? They're reaping just what they sowed. If they hadn't backslidden, it wouldn't have happened. You see, that's what you get. If you heard that kind of language, we've all used it. The Bible said, rejoice not when thine enemy stumbleth. Rejoice not when they fall. If you're going to follow that through to the logical conclusion, that means that even when government officials, politicians that you despise fall, you're not to rejoice in it. You're not to gloat over these things. You take it to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, lift me, give me a heart of compassion and give me a heart of love. I'm going to tell you something. I've disagreed many times with some of the policies of Mr. Lyndon Baines Johnson. But I'll tell you something. When I found out this man's popularity went down to 28%, and I thought of this man carrying the weight and the burden of a nation on his back, and having to pick up the newspapers and read of all the criticism, in spite of all the mistakes, I could have nothing but compassion and pity in my heart. And I wonder sometimes, friends, if we as charismatic Christians think that it's all right to, to, to spend our bitterness, our, our hatred, not so much our hatred, but our ill feeling, as long as we don't do it toward a Christian brother, that we can spend any kind of, uh, of emotion as long as it's not among our own brother and sister. This says all our enemies. Holy Ghost love will take you out of your way to be kind to your enemies. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. I was recalling this evening, a number of years ago, having to deal with a young lady, one of my workers. She found it convenient to break our rules and counsel with the boys. Now, we have a rule at Teen Challenge. The girls work with the girls and the boys are the boys. And every time somebody breaks that rule, there's always been trouble. And thank God, it, we've had very little of it, only three or four cases. And it's been tragic. We had one girl run off with a, a drug addict at one time. She broke that rule. She had an illegitimate child with him. He went to jail for murder. And that little child was taken from her. And I saw her a few years ago. She was working for the Salvation Army in New York. And it was totally cold in her heart. And, and she was afraid, ashamed to even look me in the face. Another preacher's daughter, a minister's daughter, broke that rule, went out with a drug addict, fell in love with him, broke the rule, and they've both been living a life of hell and misery ever since. But this young lady was sneaking out the back porch against all the rules, and she was counseling with this boy. He would tell her all her troubles, and this boy was a con artist. This boy was there just to, to play on our emotions. He had never really surrendered his heart to the Lord. He was still possessed with the enemy. This boy had ruined numbers of young ladies and made prostitutes out of them to support his habit. The boy's name was Angelo. One day she came to me and said, Mr. Wilkson, I'm in love with Angelo. I want to marry him. It frightened me. I called her in my office. I said, now look. Betty, I've told you once, I've told you twice, and I've told you over and over again that we don't allow you to talk to any of the boys here. You're supposed to stick with the girls, and I told you there'd be trouble. That boy is really unconverted. I'm going to make him leave this center. That boy is still full of the devil. He's just going to get you, make a prostitute out of you, and damn your soul. I got on the telephone, called her mother in Virginia, and I told her the story, and I said, I want her to come home tonight. I had the secretary call the bus company, she was to leave that night at 6 o'clock. I gave her the bus fare. She had her bags packed. I'd already asked Angelo to leave. He had left an hour or so before. I thought she went home. Imagine how surprised I was a week or two later when one of my associates came and said, Mr. Wilkerson, you know that Betty is living in a hotel just two blocks from the center, and Angelo's visiting her in her hotel rooms. I got the, name, I got the number of the room, and the associate went with me. We knocked on the door, and nobody answered for about five minutes. I could hear somebody scurrying around inside. And then 
In about five minutes, she came to the door and opened it sheepishly. Her face was burning red. She said, what do you want, Mr. Wilson? I said, I thought I told you to go home. She said, well, you're not my boss anymore. I said, well, I want to come in. And I pushed my way in with my associate. And I said, is Angelo visiting you? She said, oh, no, no. I said, is he in the apartment right now? She said, no. And I went into the bedroom and I looked in the closet and I looked behind the chair and I looked everywhere. I went all over the apartment, looked everywhere except under the bed. I should have. I went into the living room, satisfied that he wasn't there. And I sat down for the next 15 minutes and I told her what I thought. I said, this boy is full of the devil. This boy is going to make a prostitute out of you. This boy has, he can't possibly love you because you're unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. It's unscriptural. It'll never work. And I said, that boy is no good yet until Christ can get a hold of him. It, 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 there's just no hope for you. And I noticed my associate trying to get my attention. He was shaking his hand and, and I couldn't understand. And then he motioned for me and I walked over toward the door. I looked in the bedroom there. I saw two feet sticking out under the bed. I said, okay, Angelo, I know you're here now. You can come out. He came out all right. His arms wailing and he was cursing. He jumped on me and was going to beat me up and he got me down. Fortunately, I had my associate with me. My associate pinned him up against the fireplace there and put his hands behind him. And with his hands behind him, I felt pretty strong and safe. I went over to him. I, I jumped up and, and, and shake the dust off. I said to myself, bless God, I'm a man of God. Nobody touches me. Nobody gets away with that. I'm, nobody touches God's anointed. I'm God's man, and he's going to know it. And I went over to him and stuck a finger right on his chest. That was easy. His hands were pinned behind his back. I said, look, Angelo, the Bible says, touch not my anointed. Do my prophets no harm, and I'm God's anointed. If you got away with this, my life wouldn't be safe anywhere on the street. He said, look, I know where you walk on the street, and one night I'm going to find you and put a knife in your back. And I, I said, look, nobody talks to me like that. I, I said, nobody, nobody talks to me like that. I like to think I was righteously indignant, but I was just plain old mad. I walked huffing and puffing back to the center. I said, Joe, he's not going to get away with it. I'm going to get a hold of God and send judgment on him. I went back to my room, into my office, and I knelt down, and I put my claws before the Lord, tears rolled down my cheeks. Poor little David stood there before his mighty God and said, now, Lord, you know I've given my life for these drug addicts, and you know how he did me wrong now. He could have killed me, and he's threatened to kill me, Lord, and you know that I can't stand for anybody trying to threaten me or my life won't be safe here on the street. Put him on his back, Lord. Put him down. Put him down. Put him on his back. Deal with him, God. Get him. <laughs> oh, God's prophet was all stirred up. I was zealous over a righteous cause. After all, I was right. Oh, friends, I was right. Believe me, I was right. And suddenly, a thought burst in my through my subconscious. What do you want me to do, David? Call fire down out of heaven and burn him up? And then I remembered the disciples threatening to call fire down out of heaven. And the Lord said, I came not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And the Lord said, David, I called you to New York to show compassion and love no matter what they do. I came, I called you to New York to save these boys and not to destroy them. And when I saw it, and I knew it was the Holy Ghost talking to me. It was then in that room that God showed me that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a baptism of love. And that well that's springing up inside of you is a well of love that springs up. And the Bible said it cast out all fear. Perfect love. His Holy Ghost love is perfect love. And when it flows up through you, it cast out your fear. It cast out the fear of all those around you. And that is the well of living water that springs up. And I raised my hands and said, oh, God, forgive me. Fill my heart with love for that boy. Help me to love Angelo. Save him, Lord. Don't let him be lost. And in my mind, I could picture him just a lost little drug addict that had been led astray by the devil. And I was on my way. Uh, an hour or two later, I had to leave for the airport to go to Dallas, Texas for a crusade. Nikki drove me to the airport. And uh, I was telling him, Nikki heard about it. And he said, don't worry, I got the boys ready. 
And uh, I said, well, they, that's all right. We don't need them. And all the way down to Texas and do the crusade and back on the plane, God filled my heart with love for that boy. Oh, it, did the, it was just bubbling in me, a love for that boy. I couldn't wait to get back. Nicky met me at the airport. He said, hey, Mr. Wilkes, you got company waiting for you. Backyard of the center. I said, Angelo? He said, yeah. He said, but don't worry, I got the boys there. <laughs> Nicky's always got his boys there. I said, well, that's all right, Nicky. He said, I, I need to see him. I got out of the car, and there he was sitting on the back porch on the steps, his hand on his head, and he was, he was scowling at me. I knew he couldn't wait to get a fist in my face and a shim knife in my stomach. But by now, I didn't have any fear. You see, perfect love cast out all fear. You see, the fear of the Lord is only the beginning of wisdom. But the maturity of wisdom is perfect love that cast out that fear. And so... There was no fear now. And I said, look, Angela, before you say anything, come on in the office, i got to talk to you a minute. And I was walking through the kitchen, and, and Nicky pointed two boys by the door at my office. He's got his boys there, you know. <laughs> Walked in, and he sat down, and he plopped down a chair beside me. I said, Angelo, I said, before you say or do anything, I just want you to know that God's put love in my heart for you. And I said, and I want to apologize. He, I said, I wanted to send God's judgment on you. And I said, I think I could have done it. But God showed me that wasn't the reason. I said, I just want you to know that I'm sorry for my attitude. I said, before you do anything, just shake hands with me and tell me you forgive me. And I reached out to take his hand, and he looked at it and then turned away. And he looked at me again. And that kid flopped down in his chair, and then he turned and knelt and broke and began to sob like a little baby. And I got up. I'd gone back to my chair, and I got up and walked over there. And I stood over Angelo as, as he was just sobbing his heart out, just crying like, a, like, like he was dying. And I looked at that little mass, that poor little lost sheep. And I thought, what would have happened? Oh, God, and it shuddered. I, felt, I can still feel what happened in me. And I, I, I said to myself, what would have happened if I had walked in here as God's big man of the hour, God's man of faith and power, and said, Angelo, receive the judgment of Almighty God. Now, God may have honored that request for me. But I'll tell you, there was, there was something rise up in my heart. Because that boy was sick all along. That boy just needed a bit of love. You see, love takes you out of the way. On another occasion, I remember one of the girls, one of our workers coming to me and said, Mr. Wilkerson, you've got to pray for me. I've lost all my love. She said, I came, she'd come from, from the Midwest, from a farm. She said, when I first came to Teen Challenge, I was so full of love. I used to cry and weep and walk the streets, but I feel so cold. I, I, I just feel so cold. I had three or four tell me that after the, uh, the first service. Back here in the room, Mr. Wilkerson, pray for me. I've lost my love. I've lost my love. And, and she had spent two weeks. She said, for two weeks, I've been fasting and praying in the chapel. And God, give me back my first love. I said... I want you to quit praying. I want you to quit crying. Wipe your tears. And I said, here's an address. And I gave her an address on the fourth floor in apartment house on 102nd Street up in Harlem. I said, go knock on the door. And when you're done there, I said, go right down that whole apartment, all four floors, just knocking on doors, and find out what kind of need in the house. If they need the dishes done, do the dishes. Whatever it is, get in that house and witness for Jesus. She said, all right. She took another girl with her. Seven hours later, she came back bubbling over. She said, Mr. Wilkinson, I know now, I know now what you were doing. She said, now I see it. She said, I hadn't lost it. She said, it was there all the time. I just needed some victims to put it out on. I just needed somebody to love. Oh, my friends, it's not a matter of losing it as much as being in a position where there are those around you that need it to bring it out of you. And so you're sitting around here wor worrying about losing your love, your first love. And all you've got to do is get up and walk out and find somebody that needs some love, and you'll find you've got more than you can handle. Oh, yes, love. A baptism, a baptism of love. Love overpowers fear. First John 4.18 There is no fear in love. 
For perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now, friends, if you have fear and anxiety and torment in your spirit, you better check your love. Something's missing, because love casteth out fear. Now, I say that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a mighty, rushing wind of love that's sent to sweep out and cast out all your fear. That's why God has given the Holy Ghost a mighty rushing wind to clear the decks of all the fears and the anxiety. You don't need a trip to the psychiatrist. You just need to let the baptism of the Holy Ghost demonstrate for you through the power of his spirit how he can sweep these things out of your life if you exercise that love that he's given you. You've got to see the importance of this truth or your baptism is in vain. That fountain that springs up is that fountain of love. Now, there is evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and there's a test of the baptism. And love is that test. Love is above the gift of tongues. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. The truly baptized person is one who loves all his enemies. He loves his God with all his heart and mind and soul and strength, and he loves his neighbors himself. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? I remember a young man coming to me, young Negro lad, about seven, eight years ago. I was holding a crusade in Albany, New York. And he knocked on my hotel room. He said, Mr. Wilson, can I come in and talk to you? I said, yes. He, he said, I read your literature about what's happening down at Teen Challenge in New York. He said, I want to come and work with you. And I, I said, look, son, do you have love? Have you been baptized? And he goes, oh, yes. I said, do you have love for souls? He said, well, I don't think so. He said, I, I don't know. I don't think I do. I don't have too much love. I said, well, then I can't talk to you anymore. I said, I'll be here another day. You go to prayer tonight and ask the Lord to show you what it means to be baptized with love. Let him open up that fountain of love and then come back. If you can tell me you really love the lost and you'll walk the streets with love in your heart, then I'll take you as a worker. He knocked on my door the next day. And I said, yes. He said, I still want to work with you, Mr. Wilkson. I said, fine. Did you pray last night? Oh, yes. Do you have love? No, I'm not sure. He said, but I'll tell you what God told me. He said, the Lord, I asked the Lord what I would do if I had real love. And he said, I told the Lord that if I really had love for the lost, I'd go out in the street and work for at least six or eight hours a day. I'd go out and put my arms around anybody. And I'd just, I'd just pour out everything I have. I wouldn't hold anything against anybody. I'd give my life. I, I, I would stay up with drug addicts that are kicking cold turkey. I would wipe the sweat from their brow. I'd hold the bucket while they were vomiting. And he went on and listed all these things that he would do if God would just give him love. I said, well, that's just what I want from you, son. He said, well, God told me to go out and do it until I get it. So I said, look, that sounds good enough for me, son. That's all right. I accept that. And I invited him. I like that kind of language. So he came to New York, and that boy started walking the streets. It was nothing emotional. He was walking the streets six, eight hours a day. He stayed up with the drug addicts. And that boy worked, and with compassion and love, that boy gave of himself. No talk about love. He didn't even think he had it. Didn't even know what it was. But he was doing it. And about three weeks later, we were at Glad Tidings Tabernacle. I'll never forget it. And I gave an altar call. And here came this young Negro lad to the front. And there were three drug addicts he'd brought in off the street, right outside Glad Tidings Tabernacle. And he was kneeling there with his arms around them. Tears were streaming down his cheeks. And those drug addicts were getting converted. And I said, and I, I said, look, son, it looks like now that God has given it to you. He said, well, it doesn't make any difference now, Mr. Wilkes, and I'm doing what I'd do if I had it anyhow. <laughs> it's not a matter of making something. It's not a matter of taking it out and inspecting it and say, do I love? 
Do I have this much love or this much love? Is it there? Examining it, introspection. No, it's just a matter of giving yourself. It's a matter of saying this is what should be done and I'll do it. Feelings or no feelings, emotions or no emotions. Just giving. Giving of yourself. I'm pointing to the importance, friend, of another matter of love, and that's the gift of gentleness. You know, I've been holding meetings for Catholic friends, and all these nuns who come forward to my crusades, they come backstage and cry. I've seen something in those dear nuns that I see very seldom. I see the gift of gentleness, the fruit of gentleness, that quiet, gentle spirit of giving. Oh, doesn't it... Have you ever stopped to look at yourself? Have you ever stopped to think that that critical tongue that you have... With, when you run down the church, you run down people, you judge people the way they act, the way they dress, and you say that you're a Christian, that you're baptized with the Holy Ghost, and that tongue of yours has been dipped in gall and bitterness. Oh, God, help us to dip that tongue in love. Ask God to take it out. And what happens in your home, friends? Do you trade coldness for coldness? Do you trade argument for argument? Or are you a Holy Ghost peacemaker in your home? Have you learned to take things instead of just dishing it out all the time? And there are some people that think that they've been raised up by God to be prophets, to set everything in order, including the pastor, the deacons, and everybody else. They accuse the, the, the pastor of taking too much in his hands, and they accuse the assistant pastors of laziness and the music director of not singing too fast or too slow. And I'll tell you, we could write a book we could write a book on the kinds of criticism that spirit-filled people are guilty of. Now, come on, friends. Things shouldn't be that quiet right now. I can't tell you why I preach like this tonight. I haven't talked to the pastor. But I'll tell you this. I know that I preach in the will of God, and I've got his message for this hour right now. God wants to take out of our hearts that bitterness, that criticism, and give us a baptism of Holy Ghost love, L-O-V-E. Love for everybody, your enemies, the pastor, the Sunday school teacher, all the deacons, and your wife, and your husband, and your children, and everybody, your next door neighbor. That's right. The next door neighbor, even though he hasn't returned your lawnmower for the past two years. And he wants to put a kind of love in your heart that you don't come home from work and kick the dog. Oh, yes. And grab that newspaper and yell and scream around the house like little King Tut. And there sits the Holy Ghost man sitting there. He, he's already blasphemed the whole family. He's yelled and screamed all over the house. And there he sits, God's man. God, take that out of us. God, give us a spirit of gentleness. I don't believe in cowards and sissies, but I believe that God wants to give us a baptism of love in our homes, in our lives, on a job, in the church. And I tell you, friends, if you don't humble yourself and come his way, he has a way. God has a way. That way is hard. I would like, in my own heart now, to say, Jesus, give me love even for the long-haired, bearded hippies. No more talking about or screaming about the way they act or behave. We don't have to be a partaker of their sins. We can cry out against their sins. But God, give us a heart of compassion. You know, some our young people are trying to say something to us today. And Dad, Mom, sometimes we refuse to listen that God would give us an open heart to love and a heart of compassion. Do you have that tonight? Do you have a baptism of love? Is there anybody that you hate? Is there anybody tonight you have a grudge against? Is there anybody in the world I want to say something tonight, and this is not boasting, but I, I, God has been so good. I can't think of anybody in the world tonight that I despise. I can't think of anybody that I have a grudge against. I, I, I just, it makes me feel so warm tonight to know that there's nobody. Now, I know a lot of people may not feel that way about me, but bless your heart, I just refuse to hold those things in because that love, I've just said, Lord, you're the baptizer, just sweep it out, take it out now. Let this well spring up within me, this well of love. Father, do that for us tonight, in this meeting tonight. Take out the bitterness. Take out the critical tongue. 
Take it out, Lord, because bitterness and sweetness cannot pour out of the same fountain. If we've been baptized with the Holy Ghost, our tongue should be dipped in oil. Oh, God, take out the bitterness. Help us, Lord, to speak a good word in season to the weary heart.